From the studios of Vineland Media in New York City and potentially heard by billions around the world via the iTunes podcast, Simulcast is always on 520 AM, the heartbeat of Rocky Point Beach, Long Island. It is the Big Mike Radio Program, Season 8, Episode 3, joining me back once again from their undisclosed remote locations. We have Alberto, how are you? Early. And, of course, Luis. Now, you guys, this is the first episode you guys are doing not in the same place because I know you guys have separated locations by mandate of Governor Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> yeah, you got too much sexy in one house. It's just, you know. Well, they're brothers. <laughs> it's, always so work. it's always sexy. We're going to jump right into it because the person we have joining us today is very, very busy. She's got another meeting right up against the Big Mike Radio program. I met her about two months ago, I would say, before the world came to an end. And I knew right away, I said, there's an individual that I want to have on the Big Mike radio program. I have so many questions. We have Sky Ostriker, or Ostriker, Ostriker. Sky Ostriker, thank you so much for joining us on the Big Mike radio program. Thank you for having me. I met you because you were working on the Mike Bloomberg campaign. What exactly was your title working with the Mike Bloomberg campaign? So I was the regional organizing director on the Mike Bloomberg campaign overseeing Nassau County. And yes, we had a very exciting office with a lot happening and there was a lot of momentum building. And it's really a shame how the campaign ended sort of coincidentally right around the time this virus happened. What did you think when I walked into your office that day. I, was, well, I, had a, I had a bag of bagels with me. I was reaching out on behalf of the radio station I work for. Then I handed you a book with me with no shirt on the cover. What were you thinking? <laughs> I thought you were a character. Oh, yeah, I yeah. am. But that's a no-brainer. But I thought it was a good pitch. You came in. You offered us bagels. You were pleasant and, and easy to talk to. And it was nice. And then someone from the station followed up and said, can we work together? What do you have going on? Can we do advertising? Can we work with you on some stories? So now the unfortunate truth here, despite all of the flattery that Sky is throwing my way, Sky is married, correct? Yes. Damn. All right. Well, (laughs) then we'll just hop over that. So how did you get into working political campaigns? Was there something about Mike Bloomberg or have you been working campaigns for a while? So actually, I studied chemistry in college at the University of Miami, and I was inspired by the president of the school at the time, Donna Shalala, who worked in the Clinton administration, and she brought in President Clinton as a guest speaker to class. And hearing the two of them talk about the White House, I was inspired to go into politics. So I graduated college, and I came back home to Long Island, and that's when I met Tom Swazi who was running for Nassau County Executive at the time. Now he's in Congress. But then he was a political candidate, and I thought he was cool, so I hopped on board his race. And then the rest is history. I've worked in politics and government since. Does it matter which candidate you actually go work for, or you, do you consider yourself like a hired gun? Well, it was Tom's campaign, and then I, hadn't, I did some fundraising with a firm that consulted for a variety of state campaigns on Long Island, and then I worked in um, public relations and lobbying. That's my most recent position until taking a leave of absence to come work on the Mike campaign. How did you get into the actual Bloomberg campaign? I think each campaign is different. Like, uh, it depends on the size of the campaign. That is a presidential campaign. So in this situation, it was John Calvelli, who was in charge of New York State for the campaign, who called me and invited me on board. Were you- and uh, I don't need to know a figure, but did he throw crazy money at you? Compared to other presidential campaigns, the Bloomberg campaign was known to have paid their staff very well. well so, I'm a fan of Bloomberg, so that's the only reason why I asked. Were you in a position where you'd be hopeful for a position in the administration? Is that the level of political help you were offering? 
Yes, I had told my husband, get ready, honey. We're moving to DC and let's get every all of our friends and family on board and tell them that they're all invited to the White House Christmas party next year. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you're working for a campaign and it suspends its campaign? So I was fortunate enough to be on a leave of absence from my office, Nicholas Lentz Communication. So my plan was to return to my office. Most people were not in that situation. So those people remain unemployed or freelancing or hopped on board a different campaign um, because Mike Bloomberg endorsed Joe Biden. There was some relationship built between that campaign and the Bloomberg campaign. So everyone pretty much is on their own. What do you think it's like working for the Biden campaign now during this crisis? Well, working for any campaign now is not the same. It's not out there meeting voters, shaking hands, building relationships. Yeah, it you're never going to shake hands again. Ever. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I, you know, on my show, Life Before the Virus, I spoke with someone who is a political candidate running for office, looking to get out the vote, and you can't meet people. So people are getting creative with virtual happy hours and virtual fundraisers. So it's completely different. You can't knock on someone's door. You can't walk into a campaign office like you did that day, Big Mike, into my office in Mineola. It's just completely, yeah. it's different. Do you think this will hurt campaigns? Is it easier? Is it more difficult? Or is the curve Is gonna Biden going to win? Is Biden going to win? Can you just tell us that? That's the information <laughs> we're looking for right now. That I really don't know. It's very hard to say. Something like this is obviously unprecedented. So we're going to see how it affects everyone. And, and every industry is impacted. Campaigns and, and everything. Did you guys watch? the debates live like together as a team yeah some of them we did we held watch parties for our volunteers and for our team but like my office on long island was just a small piece of the entire national yeah. team yeah. are you a big fan of the west wing i feel like i asked you that when i came and met you that day did you watch the west wing no i haven't seen it i'm not a big <sighs> tv person to be honest Ah, well, it's a great show. I, I highly recommend it. If you, I can't imagine that somebody works in the political arena and wouldn't watch a show like that. I guess now, now would be the time to get into a TV show, right? In this quarantine mode that we're in. <laughs> yeah. Are, are, what are you doing during quarantine mode? Are you able to work remotely besides the Life Before the Virus series? So things at my office have been kind of quiet we, and at Nicholas Lentz Communications we focus on tourism and hospitality industries so real quiet very quiet kind of kind of quiet so my leave of absence has continued since the Bloomberg campaign hence the birth of life before the virus yes i thought you were going to tell me you were pregnant and i was like wow <laughs> she was pregnant jeez <laughs> no you tell all right, yeah, so tell us a little bit about the Instagram series, Life Before the Virus. I think it's impressive the type of guests that you've had on being it's something that you just started. Thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that. So it was started because those are some of my connections and contacts throughout various industries. I've had reporters and elected officials and different leaders from different organizations and someone who works on the census. So it's really informational people who do a lot of grassroots organizing who are out there in industries that involve speaking to people and, and life before the virus talks about how their lives have changed and the world is not going to be the same again. You know, like you said, we're not going to shake hands ever again. Governor Cuomo today said he's mandating that we all have to wear a face mask effective Saturday. So life before the virus chronicles what we used to do because, you know, in the future, we're going to have kids <laughs> and families down the line. And we're going to say, remember that virus? Remember the virus? <laughs> Isn't it hard to believe that this we always knew something like this may happen it's just so surprising that it happened now and it happened during our lifetimes do you feel that way and do you feel the people you speak to feel that way i hadn't thought of it as we always knew something like this would happen this it really feels like the end of the world doesn't it yeah, yeah. i think i'm not i was naive enough to believe that we would be able to control something like this too 
I mean, it's 2020. We live in the United States. We are letting a virus, you know, take down so many people. I, I, I wasn't, I was not even enough to believe, like, yeah, it's not our problem. Like, this, is, this situation that we're in is worse than any science fiction movie that I've ever seen. <laughs> anyway. Absolutely. And let me just clarify what I meant to say. What I meant to say was, I think in the back of our minds, we all thought something like this might happen. I just really thought that it would be something man-made and way worse than what it is. While it is extremely bad, and yes, it has completely paused the entire global economy and it has changed the way we live our lives in it, it did it in less than two weeks in less than two weeks where we were we were all slapping five on march 1st and by march 15th we were all looking at each other like get away from me i figured something like this on this scale would have been something deliberately created as an attack and that if you got it it instead of whatever the chances that you might die, I thought it'd be like a 90% chance that you die if you want it. That's what I meant by, in the back of my mind, something like this could happen. Mm -hmm. No, I, I wasn't prepared for it. Well, it sounds like none of us were really too prepared for it. I do want to get to that statement from the governor earlier today that he's mandating the, the wearing of masks or face coverings. It's not just masks, correct? It's also face covering. I've been wearing my my Your bandana. <laughs> no. well, I can't wear a regular mask. Does a face covering? Come on, the beard. The beard is magnificent. I haven't been shaving it. You got to just give me the. And today I conditioned it for the first time in a long time. I got some new conditioner. Wow. Yes, it's very it, it's very nice. Earlier today, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo made it in a statement and I feel bad because I didn't actually listen to his press conference today. And I've been talking a lot about the fact that you need to listen to the press conferences and you can't just listen to what people say. People said you have and to actually listen. New York to, speaks. You listen, Mike. I, I apologize. Listen, I was very busy. I'm doing a lot of stuff for, from home for work and I pre and I'm happy that I still do that. I do, I do have a job. I made it through another pay period. Very excited about that. Conditioning his beard. <laughs> but he talked about the fact that he's going to mandate that New Yorkers wear masks or face coverings. Now, they're very specific about the language. They're saying if they're in public places and they can't maintain the six foot social distancing. Why do you think he's very he's being very specific about the language in that and not just blanket it? Hey, you go outside, wear your damn face cover. Well, well, because I think it has to come back to reinforcement. Are there going to be cops, you know, issuing tickets about to people who don't have a face covering? I think that's maybe where it comes back to the reinforcement. I think that if people, I think the public should be in charge of enforcement. I think if they see you not wearing a face covering, they should look at you the same way they used to look at you when you just sneezed and you didn't cover your face. Right. Even the other day, I went out without a face mask and I felt really shamed. Yeah, it's, it's true. Not <laughs> it's true. It, it really is flipped in the last two weeks. I yep. used to see people wearing the mask and go, didn't science tell me that the mask doesn't really protect you? It doesn't protect the mask wearer. It protects everybody else from the person wearing the mask. Right. But do we know first? All right. I have a couple of questions here, and I know nobody on this call is a medical expert. But you said chemistry. A lot of crazy anatomy. Yeah, your chemistry. Do you, uh, can you give us the definition of emulsification? Ooh, I'm spot. I think that has to do with a fat, a solid going in. Uh, hey, did you just fat. call me? Did you just call me fat? <laughs> it has to do. It's the uh, the breaking down when you add a third element in. Kind of. So soap is an emulsifying agent. Uh huh. Breaking down a fat. I think it breaks yeah, sure. down anything. Well, okay. maybe a fat. Who the fuck? I don't know. I used to be a funeral director. That's why I asked the question. It's the only thing I remember from chemistry. Well, not <laughs> the only thing, but it's one of the things I remember from chemistry. Were you a funeral director? Yeah, before I worked for Disney World and then the radio and then Subway. Well, there's a whole big story. Did you read the book? Did you <laughs> give the book to Mike Bloomberg? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't no, give the book I, to I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't bring it with me to his last hurrah party. <laughs> you should have. That would have been the perfect going away present. Sorry, you're not going to be the president. Here's this book about fat people. I got you, Mike. You give me a copy. I'll get it to his office. <laughs> I, I still don't have all the updated information. I want to know this. We know there's a difference between wearing the N95 mask 
and the other surgical masks and or a bandana. Correct? Everybody understands that there's a difference between those, right? Mm -hmm. The N95 mask, the actual professional medical mask, that does protect the person wearing the mask. Am I correct? Right. right. From what we understand. Okay. The surgical masks or any other type of face coverings, they are supposed to protect you from me, but not me from you if you're not wearing a mask. Right. Right. Well, the N95 mask is a respirator versus... If they knew that the only way they could reopen the entire economy is by saying everybody should wear an N95 mask, I think they would do that. The only problem is they, we don't have that many N95 masks. Mm -hmm. So going back one more step to my question, how much does it actually protect you from me if I wear a face covering? If I have the virus and you and I are hanging out and I wear a mask, but you don't, does it just significantly decrease the chances that you're going to get it? Or does it eliminate the chances you're going to get it? Does anybody know? I think that this is all up in the air. And just, I have my master's in public health also. And just from a basic prevention-based practice, the more covering up we can do, the more social distancing we can do, the better. So that's the guideline. And, and it's not get an N95 because those will reserve for the healthcare workers, the hospital workers, the nurses, and the doctors who need them. Just But whatever you can do to avoid close contact and just cover your face can help. Okay. I have a theory that they knew that if everybody wore masks, not the respirators, let's just say face coverings, I think they, they knew that a while ago. But they said to themselves, if we go out at the beginning of this thing and tell everybody to wear masks, yes, there will be no masks for anybody in the healthcare industry to, to get because everybody on earth is going to be scrambling for a mask. So I feel like they waited, a little, they waited as long as they possibly could to say, okay, yes, wearing a mask is going to help us reduce the spread. Do you think I'm insane for thinking that? Or do you think that that's, that was factored into the decision to not uh, think, state it two weeks ago. I don't, I, I, I feel like you're not alone in your thoughts, but I do have faith in government leaders because I know so many of them and I, I have faith in them and I know that they will make the right choices and be honest with everyone. I, I really believe that. I also think they just didn't know. I think they're literally learning the science behind it every day. Yeah, so it's unprecedented. It it, right, so it might be like, they, the, the small sample of, let's say, 10,000 people, they thought it was – because at first they were like, ah, it's not transmissible by air as long as you cover your mouth, like, a, like you know, like common cold. But I think the bigger the sample, the better, you know, the yeah. actual understanding of the virus. So I think, you know, what we have, what, over 2 million in the U.S. now, and I think you have a large sample to actually start figuring shit out. Um and I think the mask thing, I think once they figured out, like, hey, we should probably tell people, I think they told that part. I don't think they withheld that. Only because by this point, even two weeks ago, even if you wanted to get um, N95 masks, you weren't going to get it. You just I don't even think you're going to get it now. I don't even think you're going no, no, you okay, want an two N95. Weeks ago, two weeks ago, it was still optional, and you still weren't going to find it. Right? So now being – so I just – I don't think they waited – for that reason yeah. to, to, you know, to make sure the hospitals and stuff had, it. I just think no one, no one knew, no one, no yeah. one knows. To your point, there was a lot of learning on the fly. It was bringing in professionals and, and every day is different. And the governor to his credit says that on his daily press conferences, there's a lot of questions and he'll say, I don't know if he doesn't know the answer to something. I think there's a lot of learning that's still happening. Yeah. I absolutely believe that the governor is doing as good a job as you could do in this situation. I think my question has more to do with this revelation that I had earlier today. So they tell everybody now wear face coverings. Is that a supplementary prevention method to help keep the curve flat or decrease the spread? Or, or is it the first step towards possibly getting the economy open again? In other words, if they say, hey, everybody wear a face covering. Surgical mask or a bandana will do. Everybody wear a face covering, and now we could come out of our houses again. Or is it just, hey, we need to do more to slow the spread 
It has nothing to do with reopening the economy. It has everything to do with keeping the curve flat. I think it's a little bit of both. It's definitely a little bit of both. But I also think it has a lot to do with the fact that we've reached the flattened point. Is what Cuomo keeps saying. Oh, yeah. We don't want to go back because if he sees another spike, you're going to have a lot of people saying this was all for nothing. And I don't believe that, but that's what you're going to hear. I agree. The last thing you want, and it's gonna be it's gonna be worse, is if we get like, the, the numbers keep going down, we restart the economy. Everyone's going to work for three weeks, and then we all shut down again. That is gonna be by far of the a, a worst fall down in the economy. You can't get this wrong twice. Mm-hmm. Fool me once, but you can't get fooled again. So, like, you can't you just, fool me again. Just, That's what I'm saying. Gotta get it. <laughs> yeah. the, the right hand with the left hand um, but yeah. you know it, just, it depends it, you, you just can't get this wrong so any precaution even if it's just a one percent better chance that you're not gonna get it with any layer you gotta you gotta you gotta take the, the best yeah. thing though to focus on really is what's next and that is where we can think about most people that get this virus survive So what do we do with these people? They have to go out and donate blood and plasma to research hospitals and scientists so they can study and study the antibodies and give them to other people and search for a cure. And there is a movement that was started by a woman from Long Island, Diana Barrett, who I actually met on the Bloomberg campaign. She came into my office in Mineola and she lives in Port Washington, and she started this Survivor Corps as a Facebook page, and there's 33,000 members now, and these research institutions are reaching out to her and to Survivor Corps to try and connect with participants for their clinical studies, and that's really ahead of the curve. Talk about flattening the curve. This is really ahead of the curve, so if we wanna talk about reopening the economy, It's with the survivors and people who are given antibodies from those who were sick and recovered. So that's the next step of this. Are you going to have her uh, be a part of the Life After the Virus series? So believe it or not, (laughs) she's been so inundated with media requests. She's actually asked me to help her manage these incoming media requests. She's been on CNN, NBC, MSNBC, Fox and Friends, all the national TV programs and and more, night shows, daytime shows. So I'd love, love, love to have her on Life Before the Virus, but it's a small potato show compared Mm -hmm. to some of the big guns she's been on. But yes, the, the plan is to have her on Life Before the Virus. That would be awesome. What is next for life before the virus, which they can catch on your Instagram at the fashionable Democrat. Yes, that's my Instagram handle, the fashionable Democrat. So what's next? What's next up for life after the virus? Life before so the virus. Life after the next virus. Up, you know, I record these episodes and then I post them each night around nine o'clock. So I have a few in the pipeline. I have some state elected officials. Up until now, I just featured some city elected officials. I have some state level electeds. I have someone in charge of the bid program for New York City. I have a chef talking about the restaurant business. That'll be my first chef on the show who actually was just planning on opening a restaurant right before the virus happened. So we'll hear about that. And really, every industry is impacted. So I'm looking for different people to come on life before the virus who have a story to share about their industry, which is any industry. All right, I know you got to jump off and head off to your next meeting. Sky Ostriker, you can catch the Life Before the Virus Instagram series on her Instagram handle, The Fashionable Democrat, which, yes, she is. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sky. Thank you so much for having me. All right, after the break, we're going to bring back two old favorites from the Big Mike radio program, Vault. We're also going to open up Big Mike's mailbag. You're listening to the Big Mike Radio program on the Violent Media Network. Back after this. You're listening to the Big Mike Radio program on the Violent Media Network. Yeah, 
look on my face I've been drinking my beer by the case Really love this place I'm an issue with Lady Licker Licking Lady Licker don't make me sicker She gets that line, I'll take her Down the line, come on! That's right, baby Aw, oh, yeah You know it, I got something to say Come on, sitting on the end Living all I can This is what I did, so I'll do it again Go on by and I gotta look back Wow You know why You know I like that so good looking and I wish I knew her You know what? I can't pursue her Look ahead, one's on the pass With a nice pair of legs and a pretty little Done with this, so you think I'll switch? Don't mess with me, baby Ha ha ha, yeah That's right, man We come straight at you Done it all, I'm worth the deuce Now the green's gonna say you're loose, baby That's right, it's the Big Mike Radio Program, Season 8, Episode 3. That was a fantastic segment. You can check out Life Before the Virus on Sky's Instagram, The Fashionable Democrat. Before we open up Big Mike's Mailbag, I really, we've gotten a lot of letters since we've come back. It's Season 8, we've gotten a lot of letters. People are listening. We're very happy about that. I love the feedback. Keep it coming. 
in order to help me answer these questions. Actually, I'm going to do it like a little bit of a town hall because it's a special occasion. We're bringing back J.B. King. You heard him in the first episode. He was a staple of the Big Mike radio program back in the day. J.B. King, how are you? Good. The OG. You know, uh, back here we are. I talked about our next guest in the first episode and in the second episode. You knew it was just a matter of time before we brought him back. Ladies and gentlemen, the foremost authority on everything, Little Mike from Brookline, Massachusetts. How are you? Good, good, good. Home of Conan O'Brien. Really? And the and Hurricane JFK. Peter McNeely. And JFK. Uh. So how are things going up there in Massachusetts? Uh, are you guys still out of work? Are you in work? Are you going to the grocery stores in a hazmat suit? What's going on? The only place I have been to in the past two weeks has been the grocery store. And what did it look like? Did it look like uh, Chapter 4 of the Book of Revelation? It's evolved over the past couple <laughs> weeks. Now we, um, we have uh, arrows on the, the aisles to show uh-huh. us one ways and stuff like that. Everyone, uh, as of today, oh. actually, in my town, everyone is required to wear a mask or face covering in public. Here, too. Uh, here, too. Uh, or face a, I believe it's a $50 citation. Um, and then the grocery store has, like, lines outside. You got to wait. Their, you know, capacity is cutting quarters or whatever it is, like 10. Is that, is that happening at every grocery store you're going to? Up there, or are you just, it's the one that you go to, so that's the one you go to, and it's got a line? Well, I don't have a car, and it's three blocks away, so that's the one we're going to. Um, Sunday, it's supposed to be like 60 to 65, so I may take a walk to a different store. Um, it's a little further away, but it is a, it's a mass, I guess, ordinance, whatever it is, edict from on high or something. Like, all the, all the grocery stores need to be at, like, 20% capacity, that kind of thing. Every, it, there's like face shields at the counters, everything. It's, it's by directive uh, by the governor. JB, are you seeing that too? Grocery stores that you can't get into, you need to wait on a line to get into? Yeah, there were two different ones. So we were trying to use Fresh Direct uh, for a while. We were successful for the first like three weeks. But then uh, as of last week, we couldn't get a spot. So we were running out of food and needed to go to the grocery store. So we went to two of them. Uh, The first one that I went to was they had a line where you had to wait inside to get in. And it was a cold day. So I just decided, let me go to the other place. The other place didn't have a line, but based on the number of people inside, it should have had a line. I was really taken aback by the amount of people that were in there and the sort of not really taking it seriously, the social distancing. Uh, Not to say that people were right on top of you, but uh, yeah, and I don't know if it was more of a product of me just not being amongst a lot of people in about a month, but it it really kind of put me uh, on the defensive. You know, I wanted to go get... What was the brand of that? What was the brand of that? What was the brand of that... uh, that grocery store. It, that home out. Key food. Home out. See, that's funny because now key I'm getting foods. nervous. Now you're making me scared. Now I'm getting a little nervous over here. Yeah. Because I, and this is now a month of this stay-at-home order, I have yet to encounter mm. the grocery stores with a line to get in. In my uh-huh. defense, I've only visited two grocery stores near my house, stop and shop, no line to get in, right? But key food, no line to get in. But I didn't really think it was overcrowded. It didn't seem overcrowded to me. It, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't packed. But maybe if there are maybe other grocery stores are doing this, and every grocery store should be doing this, and they're leaving it up to the grocery store, and key food is not doing it. Do they got because the one way aisle I, thing going. You know, and, and pro- they don't, and they should. No, they no should one have way, one way aisle. aisle. Too. Yeah. Yeah. They should definitely have a one-way aisle. They should have done that six months ago. (laughs) What I also think they really need at grocery stores, and they should have really implemented this six months, two years ago, is that if you get more, if you get within more than six feet of the person in front of you, a big fucking spike should come out and just fucking (laughs) kill you right where you stand. (laughs) (laughs) An alarm goes off. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing makes me crazy. 
Nothing drives me more insane than somebody walking closely behind me as I'm trying to shop at the grocery store. I understand that I take it to a level that you probably shouldn't take this sort of thing, but I get very agitated. It's a, it's a social anxiety element, and I just don't understand it. Why the fuck do we got to keep following everybody? Why do we got to be on top of each other? You know I'm standing here waiting. If, and first of all, why do we need all these tunas? Too many cans of tunas. That's why I'm standing there, because there's 45 <laughs> different cans of fucking tuna. How many different coffees do we need? How many different coffee filters do we need? My father sends me out to get coffee filters. There's 400 different types of coffee filters. Can't there be like three? <laughs> Can't there be three coffee filters? And I got news for you. If I'm looking for the coffee filters, don't stand near me. Don't stand next to me. Don't be walking behind me. They need to come up with a way, whether it's a lane, you, you, like you step over to the side. I'll let people go past. I don't care. I got time. Go past me. You go around me. Go around. Go around. Hey, listen, I, I'm all for the social distancing. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, uh, I, I, like I like that. having it like where I don't want people six Six feet away. Get away from me. We should keep that in the new world. We should definitely. And I think we're going to keep it. I think I think handshakes are out. Social distancing is in. Get out. Get rid of it. I didn't want to say hi go. to these people to begin with. Can't remember people's names. Who can remember all these names? Why do we need all this tuna? Who's eating all this tuna? <laughs> Let's dip into Big Mike's mailbag. This question comes from Teresa in Little Neck, Queens. Thank you so much for listening, Teresa. We appreciate it. Do you think healthcare workers should get additional pay over and above their regular overtime pay when and if they work extra hours? Thank you so much, Teresa from Little Neck. Little Mike? <laughs> Little Neck, Little Mike. That's funny. Little Mike, that's the, uh, the question. The answer is to you. Uh, I think these are the people on the front lines. These are the people who are more essential than any, anybody right now. Going out there, they these are the people who are saving lives, and I think they. I mean, I don't I don't know what people make, but I definitely think money. They make money. I I definitely think there. I mean, I, there's a thing called hazard pay. If this isn't a hazard, then I don't know what the definition of a hazard is, because I definitely think there should be some hazard pay for this kind of shit. Because this is, I mean, there, you risk you don't risking your life so much every day doing stuff like this. Oh, man, right? Mike is really digging himself a big hole here. No, He's no, already no. said I'm saying, I'm like three general, things that I could see going to be very offensive to people. No, no. When, when you're when – you're, That'll generate the letters somebody, for next week. When you're saving uh, – shut up. When you're saving somebody from like a heart attack, you're not putting your, like, your, your life on the line. But when you're saving somebody from coronavirus, you're risking getting it. You're risking your family and friends getting it. So, yeah, there should be maybe a little extra bump there. Before JB responds to that, you said that the healthcare workers are the most essential. But couldn't a point be made that the workers that are working in grocery stores and the restaurants that are offering takeout deliveries and the truck drivers that are continuing the shipping and movement and deliveries of supplies, in a way, because most people in the country – aren't going to get the disease and aren't going to have to go to the hospital if they got the disease in a way, couldn't you say that those workers, those other frontline workers are just as essential? You could, you, you could absolutely say that. I so mean, then do they do, does, does the stock boy at key food who should be implementing a line to get in, does the stock boy and the cashier at key food, should they qualify for hazard pay? I think all essential people, like, I think we are definitely learning from this more and more what is essential and what is not essential. Like, there, there are definitely things that are, like, what do you really need to survive and live? And we are learning, like, a lot of ancillary things are just, that's what they are. They're ancillary, and, they, and they're, we take, we've taken it for granted for years. But, but what, what the government calls essential popular opinion could argue whether or not it's essential things are things have been categorized as essential that some people may not think actually are essential when i say essential i'm thinking healthcare, food basic survival things you need to like your your home and everything repairs so you have shelter and everything like that like the absolute basics so maybe there should be two 
categories of essential? What would the other one be? Like, I don't know, essential, non essential, and essential, <laughs> super, super essential. <laughs> I mean, I think about the times, the few times that I'll go out a week, maybe it's once a week, where I'm actually in contact with other people and just sort of the level of discomfort uh, that I have. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's just getting groceries where the, the odds are that, you know, I'm going to be okay. And so you imagine the people that are actually out there that are working in the hospitals, that are uh, policing the streets, that are uh, fire department, EMS, uh, people that really are on the front line who uh, are, like Mike said, uh, not only are they putting themselves at risk, but also the possibility of contaminating their families. Um, you know, but couldn't I, you I say the same doubt, for... Yet they still go in. Couldn't you say this... Where do you draw the line? Couldn't you say the same for the cashier at Key Food? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think anything that you think about what would happen if this particular job was eliminated and how there would be, whether it be some sort of massive disruption in the everyday life. Uh, so whether that's, uh, you know, the truckers that bring the food uh, to uh, the grocery stores, the people that are working and stocking the grocery stores, to the folks that work at Con Edison or any other power authority that are just keeping the lights on, keeping electricity going, uh, that uh, that feed, you know, uh, uh, you know, power to the uh, to ourselves, to the hospitals. I, I think anything. If you were to eliminate any of those uh, occupations, uh, that just the amount of chaos that would happen in an already chaotic situation. If anybody has comments and their thoughts on that, please feel free to send us a direct message at the Big Mike Radio Program Facebook page or on Instagram at The Feast Man. Question two. This question comes from Daniel in Camden. Rough time down there in South Jersey. If you have a loved one in a nursing home and they survive this, would you try to get them out after this? It's a good question. Mikey? I mean, I don't have anybody in a nursing home. I don't know what the facilities are like. I mean, I'd say it depends on the nursing home. I think there are definitely if – you, if your nursing home has handled this well, like they've had – zero to to nil like very very little death very little you know they, they've handled this very well i don't know why you would move them i think i think what this does is though it's exposed some of the bad nursing homes like like maybe it or maybe the ones that were not prepared for this as well i mean i i think it was a few years back i mean i remember there was one in like florida where uh, it was an insane amount of people had like died and stuff from like something and they just didn't report things. It was just run poorly. If, if your nursing home is run poorly and stuff like, yeah, get them the hell out of there. But where, I mean, if, but where are you going to put them? I mean, like that's, that's another question. I mean, they can all go space, stay at JB's house. There you go. If, if you have space and everything, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, mm. That might be something to consider, but if you're a nurse, if they're a nursing home, is well run. They're on top of this. They're following procedures. They were like, they, you know, didn't fall behind on any of this stuff. And they're very, very, you know, attuned to, to situations like this. I don't, I wouldn't see a reason to pull them out. JB, what about you? If you had an, uh, an, an elderly loved one in a nursing home after, I think what we're, I think the, what we're finding is what we're seeing can't be, I think what we're seeing is unfortunately just the tip of the iceberg. I could see if it was one poorly run nursing home having a massive amount of deaths and not reporting it, that would be stunning and it would be a shame. And okay, maybe that's not the way all nursing homes are run, but I'm hearing multiple stories of stuff like this, multiple stories of multiple people dying and them hiding it, which I still can't really wrap my mind around why you're hiding it. To me, during this crisis would be the one time I think if you were ever going to kill somebody, kill them now because no one's going to be looking at you sideways. They're going to go, oh, he must have died of the virus. Just hide the ghost logger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I recently went through this with uh, someone in my family, and I think, you know, your heart says, absolutely, get them out of there, uh, bring them home. But I think the reality of the situation is, is that a lot of these places are well run and they're well cared for. Uh, and the people do really care for the residents that live there. And the reality of it is that, you know, even if your best intention is to bring your loved one home, based on the limitations that your loved one has, it may not be feasible. It may actually be more of a danger to them to have them at home because you don't have the proper facilities or equipment needed to care for these. Yeah. If they were in the nursing home during the pandemic so, uh, and it took them three weeks to die, if they were living at your house, they would have been dead in a week. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if, if, if someone is, you know, uh, isn't able to, uh, you know, uh, if they're not mobile or if they need special medical, treatment or if they're at a, a fall risk or flight risk or whatever the case may be, you just may not be able to be equipped to handle that on your own. Um, yeah, but I think, the, you know, like, uh, like you guys were saying, you know, it's, it does expose a lot of the bad places, a lot of the places where the residents are really not cared for, where it's not hygienic, it's not clean. You know, the, the staff really doesn't have the residents' best intention uh, out there. So I think it really comes down to a case-by-case -case basis, and you hope that, uh, you know, you can be – uh, make the best decision for your loved one. Um, you know, I think the hardest part is that a lot of the people that are in the nursing homes at this point in their lives really can advocate for themselves yeah. and they really need the families to be there, be on top of it and basically serving as that proxy for them. And I think one of the tragedies of this is that, you know, family members are not allowed to visit and they can't really keep on, track of them and uh, yeah. keep on top of their care. Uh, so Yeah, they should have instituted a program immediately. If we, you can't be visited, they should have found a way, but you can still communicate. You can communicate with them every day. Mandatory mm -hmm. communication every day, something like that. Just to, I, I think this also shows just how important it is if you are having a family member in a nursing home if, or you're considering it how much research you should be doing into this place before you actually do it to make sure how well run they are and get feedback and everything before, yeah. before doing it to make sure they aren't one of the ones where, yeah, they're hiding fucking bodies in the freezer or something like that. <laughs> yeah. They don't even have a freezer. Just yeah. a, a well air conditioned room. All right. Yeah. Final question in big Mike's mailbag. This has been a good segment. I think this was a success and we'll do it again. Of course. Final question. This is it. Word for word. This is what he says. <clears throat> A deputy governor or some shit said that he was willing to die if it meant not losing the America he knew and loved. Do you think that there is a point where this starts to become true? If after two months of stay-at-home orders, a governor says we must stay at this level of pause until January, do you think people would accept it? Do you think people would revolt? What if he said three months, six months? What's the threshold? Omar in Detroit. Omar, thanks for the question. Thanks for listening. Little Mike. Um, I, I, I know, actually know a little bit about this. This is the lieutenant governor in Texas who said this. Um, I, I think it's a, it, it's a harsh thing to say like that. It's not eloquently put the way he put it. Um, but there is a breaking point uh, for, pe for people's sanity, I, I think. And there's also a breaking point of numbers where you'd have to look and see like, well, X amount of people are dying of the virus, X amount, of, and if we do this, X amount of people are going to die from starvation, starvation <laughs> suicide, uh, homeless, you know, being, being homeless, being suicide, suicide, depression, suicide. you know, suicide. Uh, domestic abuse, suicide. <laughs> a lot of them are going to die of suicide. <laughs> um, you know, there, there is, you know, <laughs> There, there is stuff like that where you'd have to, to you know, this, but it, it's, this isn't something where it's, 
you know, it's all or nothing. Like it's one way. It's like it's not like there's a, a two two button switch here, on and off, and like that. It's not like that. There's degrees. Um, I know somebody said the other day where um, if we opened up the, I think, I think it was the, the Dr. Oz guy, like, you know, research, there's some research show that if we opened up schools, uh, two to three percent of the people that died would because, be because of the schools. And, you know, for some, two to three percent is too high. For some, two to three percent is, you know, low enough. You know, at some, there is a and number for, where... And for Goldilocks, it was just right. Yeah, there, there is a number where <laughs> oh, hey, X ew. amount of people, like an overwhelming majority of people, will be okay with like 0.1% of death or something like... There is a number. I I don't... You know, everyone has their own thing. It's, it's just where, where that is, you'd have to like give people act, actual facts and figures. You'd have to give people the actual numbers and everything of what's going to happen for each scenario and then people can make their own decisions. But then again, a lot of those people who are, are okay with opening shit up and everything, they're living in like $10 million mansions. They're, com- they're comfy. They are living pretty. I mean, if I hear one more damn celebrity tell me everything's going to be okay and give me a pep talk from their Malibu home, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking be one of those shooters and go to fucking California and just open up a can of whoop-ass. Like, don't tell me, like, you're in this with me. Or even I'm not even in this with others. Like I'm comfy too, for for the most part. There's other people who are fighting for their fucking life, and we got people who are like billionaires, billionaires, and like we're all in this together. It's like it's it's not the same. So I I think I think if you when you actually equate it to real people and who's actually gonna die by opening things up, I think that that's a little bit different. Interesting take, JB. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly sympathize with the people who are, you know, in rough financial shapes. I mean, during the Great Recession, uh, you know, 12 years ago, I lost my job and I was out of work for a year. And that was a financial and calamity for myself. And, you know, just the the, the, the mental aspect of, for that was uh, just... Uh, just as bad but you know i think people that are going and saying that let's get back let's start everything up uh because you know uh you know if a couple people die then so be it uh you know i think they fail uh, i think the way they're thinking about it is that oh that's someone else's problem they don't see that as oh it's not going to happen to me someone i love is not going to die so if that's their rationale then which one of your family is where you'd be willing to sacrifice is it your you know is it your parent who is in their mid to late 80s are you willing to you know, maybe they're in good health and maybe they can live 10 more years. Are you willing to sacrifice them so that you can have your stock portfolio go up again? Um, you know, so I think, you know, there, there, there's a disconnect uh, uh, there in that, uh, you know, they think that it's happening uh, essentially uh, to, to someone else. And, um, you know, I, I just feel like people don't, you know, can't be that cavalier about uh, someone else's lives. Yeah, I think it's an extremely complicated issue, which is why I think the next steps we make as a society are going to be crucial, and I think they're going to be criticized. I think that there's going to be a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking because I feel like they started this entire thing under the premise, a very simple premise. It's easier to come back from financial ruin than it is to come back from the dead. This was all to prevent the collapse of the medical system, similar to what we saw in Italy. Mm -hmm. I think if they were confident that... No one was going to get turned away at a hospital because the hospital was over capacity. I think they could be turned away for other reasons. But Mm -hmm. if you got turned away from the hospital because it was over capacity, you blame the hospital. You blame the leadership. You blame the government. If you get the virus and go to the hospital and they treat you and you get put on a ventilator and you die, I think you blame the virus. 
So all of this was put into place because they didn't want to ultimately be the actual cause of people dying. Because if you actually got to the mm-hmm. point where the hospital system was overrun, people wouldn't just be dying from the virus. They'd be dying from anything that you would have needed medical care for. I do believe that there is a threshold. And I think we as a society need to acknowledge that, that there is a threshold. There's a price to pay for the decision that was made. And there is a threshold. There is a point where the destructiveness and the death and all of the negative things that will come with the extended pause of our society, there's a point where it will exceed what the virus would have done had we not taken those measures. Granted, that's probably a very, very long time. But I'm saying there's a time. Mm -hmm. JB, Little Mike, thank you so much for spending Mm -hmm. some time with me this evening. I think this was a fantastic segment. I want to thank Louis, Alberto, Sky, Little Mike, and JB King for spending some time with us. For all of us here at the Big Mike Radio Program and Violent Media to all of you around the world, this is Big Mike saying goodnight. Goodnight. Goodnight.